as we have been studying the Bible together, you may not remember everything we have read, but there are probably some of you who have come to the conclusion that there is something referred to as salvation. If the issue of salvation is excluded from the life of an individual, he or she will find themselves straggling behind when it comes to qualifying as a person. I say this because the most important words in the Bible that is, the most important thing that God asks of man in His Word is that a person must be saved. The term salvation is quite common and is often used, but there are many times when it may be misused. The term salvation is used to express being rescued when a person encounters some predicament, is abandoned, or is facing death. But when the Bible talks about salvation, it is not simply a case of a person being rescued from some difficulty or a dying man being given a new chance at life or a person recovering from an incurable disease or being rescued from an apparently inescapable difficulty. That kind of salvation can always be found within the society of man, but what is the salvation that the Bible speaks of? As I just mentioned, many people experience salvation in different ways in the course of their lives, from the day of their birth to the day of their death. There are also people who die not long after they are born. And there are many people who live for a while, but then they fall victim in the hospital. The world is such that it is not at all easy for a person to be raised well, grow up, and live a long life. The salvation that the Bible talks about is on a higher level than that. It's not so much on a higher level, is it? It's eternal. It would be no exaggeration to say that the purpose of a person being born into this world, living a brief life in the flesh, and then leaving is to receive salvation. To put it another way, the Bible also expresses this as a person who is destined for eternal punishment at the end of his short life in this world, being changed to become a person who is heading for eternal joy. The Bible expresses this with the words, he has crossed over from death to life. For example, the Bible explains that there is a certain position in which a person moves from being cursed to being blessed, from sorrow to joy, from uneasiness to peace, and is released from eternal damnation. Nevertheless, the Bible warns that among the many religious people in this world, and I'm not talking about the members of other religions, I'm talking about religious people who listen to the words of the Bible, seek God the Father, and believe in Jesus Christ. Even among these people, there may be some who are left behind. That is, left behind in regard to eternal salvation. 
In various places in the Bible, in various verses, we find reference to salvation. To give you one example, the Bible says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when He predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. There is also a verse that says, so that we do not drift away from this salvation. I'm reminded of my life in the past. I was born into a Christian family. I can pride myself as having a good and sound family. A Christian family. My father was a dedicated church member and my mother graduated from theological college. And from childhood, I received a Christian education. Yet this Christian education itself did not bring me to have assurance in my heart in regard to faith in God. I attended Sunday school from the time I was very young, but I felt uneasy when it came to faith in God and the life of faith in God. Others praised me for my diligence in my life as a churchgoer. But there were many matters that I was uncertain about. I asked myself, is there really a heaven? Is there a kingdom of God? Does God really exist? And Jesus? It seemed to me that Jesus must have existed since I had learned about him in the Bible. So I didn't have so many doubts about Jesus. When it came to the question of whether or not the person by the name of Jesus existed, it seemed to me that he did. I thought that since he was a historical figure, many people would believe in him. And I had a vague idea that when my life of believing Jesus in this way came to an end, Perhaps, God would have mercy on me. But, I believed in Jesus deep down in my heart, and I knew the way of the cross, that Jesus was crucified for our sins, the sins of all of mankind. And I always observed Easter, and so I knew the doctrine that teaches that Jesus rose from the dead. I attended church not so much because I believed, but in order to believe. At Christmas time, I put a great deal of effort into celebrating the birth of Jesus. I made such an effort that there was even one occasion when I filled the whole church with images I had painted of the process of the birth of Jesus into this world. Then, one of the elders came along and said, Mr. Yu, he addressed me as teacher because I taught in the Sunday school. Mr. Yu, you will receive a great reward when you get to heaven. You've done a great job here. But in my heart, I thought that if there was actually a heaven, I didn't expect a reward there. I would be satisfied if I were only given a tiny place right in the back corner. This is what I hoped. I thought that if heaven exists, it would be enough for me to simply qualify to go there. But since I didn't know if there was a heaven or not, rather than making an effort to go there, I simply did this kind of work to get praised. On some occasions, I would still be drawing and painting in the church until the last minute on Christmas Eve. It was always very cold, and once I almost froze to death. I put a long bench beside a heater in the church, and I fell asleep on it and didn't wake up until the early hours of the morning. It was the stiffness that woke me up, and then I realized that the heater had gone out. 
I also went through that kind of hardship. I didn't do this out of my eagerness to go to heaven. It was just part of my effort to do my best while attending church in this world in which I was living. It was the same when it came to early morning prayers. But I didn't have the kind of faith in my heart that believes in Jesus without any doubts and is free of anxiety. The problem was that there was no way that I could believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. And if anyone were to ask me about Jesus' resurrection, I couldn't answer with confidence that I believed in it, even though I had observed Easter every year for many years. I was not able to acknowledge that Jesus had risen from the dead. This is because common sense told me that when a person died, that was the end. Since heaven and hell are part of an unknown world, I couldn't say whether they existed either. But I was concerned about what I would do if they actually did exist. I wasn't able to say with confidence that I would be going to heaven. This was my life of faith. When it came to the image I had in my mind of Jesus and his character, there were his actions that seemed like magic. The image of Jesus as he took hold of Peter when Peter was sinking in the water. Since I once did a painting of this, Jesus walking on water, these images that always appear in movies, Jesus healing the sick. But I knew that Jesus had said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And in my heart I didn't believe I had done my utmost to keep this first and greatest of commandments. The Bible tells us to think deeply about Jesus, but let me show you the image that went round and round in my head as I attempted to think deeply about Jesus, based on common knowledge that I had garnered from the Bible. I imagined a hairy Jesus like this. When I thought deeply about Jesus, this was the image in my head, since I had seen a picture of something like this in a Bible when I was a child. I drew a picture of Jesus like this and colored it in. And someone said it looked like him. After I had done this drawing, some foreigner came to visit us. When he saw my picture, he asked, Do you know that man? Then he asked who had drawn the picture. When I said I had done it, he said that the man in the picture looked just like one of his neighbors. Hearing that there was someone who looked just like this, I asked what the man did for a living, and our visitor said something in Korean, but his pronunciation wasn't good, so it took me quite a while to realize he was saying gangster. The man was a gangster. You can imagine I was very disappointed. I once read about a certain artist who painted a picture of Jesus in his childhood days. Later, the artist was commissioned to paint another picture. This time, it was to be a picture of Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. As he thought about how to depict the abominable Judas, he went to a prison in search of a model among the prisoners. The model he found was a thief and a murderer. But as the artist began to work on his painting, the model said, When I was young, I was once used as a model for a good painting. The artist asked whose image he had modeled for, and the prisoner said, When I was young, I was a model for a painting of Jesus. It was Jesus as a young boy. I once read this story somewhere. 
so we may draw an image of Jesus, an image of a man. But the important point is the spirit of Jesus. and the Spirit of God. More important for me at the time was the relationship between my spirit and the Spirit of God. But I didn't give a thought to such spiritual matters. They didn't even cross my mind. I couldn't see anything more than what I knew of Jesus based on the knowledge of Him I had learned in school. I had heard some things from the Bible, but I simply thought of these things in the sense of moral standards. But later, I began to think about Jesus. But the strange thing is, it is not that I completely wasted my time. Of course, I may have wasted time on useless thoughts. I was at an age when a person has the most dreams and ambitions. But it was a time when I felt very empty. When a young man reaches the age of about 21, he has come to the point where he is able to look at the world boldly in the face. When I reached the age of about 21, I was confident when I looked ahead at the life that lay before me. This is because I thought that I entertained thoughts that did not cross the minds of other people. I was confident that I could make something of my life if I followed the path that I decided for myself. But the strange thing is, It was at that point in my life that I discovered just how precarious my confidence was. Until that point, I had not noticed this, as I had just been living my life, just running along. I was confident about the days of my youth that lay before me. But there was a problem. This was my own confidence my own courage. And it was obvious to me that things could turn out as planned, but the problem was, what would I do then? What would happen if I succeeded? It seemed as though I wouldn't get any satisfaction out of it, since I had a dream that no one else was aware of, only I knew about it. I don't know why I was like that. Life is so fragile, and yet I have no idea where my courage came from. When I was in the midst of this situation, there was a thought that came to me. Even if everything went well for me in the future, without my friends around me, without my environment, without my close relatives, if this human background to my life was not there, then happiness would be no more than a solitary flower blooming in the middle of a field. A flower needs to be in a suitable forest or a suitable environment. Or to give a closer example, my parents and my siblings were there and I depended a great deal on the friends I had grown very close to. There is a lot of weight to friendships. Even so, it didn't seem that I could share happiness with just my friends. Trusting them and entrusting myself to them completely. They were people I needed at times in the struggle to survive and at other times to share in some happy occasion. 
But that was the extent of it. It was not possible for me to put all my energy into those friendships. From time to time, I had a vague idea that I should live a moral and upright life. But I came to see how very weak I was in attempting to take on such a heavy burden. So then I wondered how I could live my life in the greatest way for my own sake. But the thought of doing that only left me feeling even more uneasy. This was because, when I thought about it, I could see that I didn't have the physique to make any real impression on society. To be successful and accepted by society, a man needs to have a certain physique. He needs to look impressive, be attractive, be good-looking, have broad shoulders and be well-built, and be manly. But I came to see that it was only the courage and ambition inside of me that was great. But my physical body was unfit for all of this. For this reason, I came to see that even if I were to make a success of my life and attain all the riches that often accompany success, these things would not be able to make me happy with all the imperfections of my human condition. I could have just lived my life without thinking about such matters. But since I read all kinds of books about life of various people, combing through the words and debates of others, I fumbled my way through all kinds of thoughts and ideas about the futility of life. Life in the future, life in the past, and history itself. In view of all this, I once reproached myself thinking, I'm a really weak being. I'm so weak. How could I have stored up such great dreams for myself? That doesn't mean I gave up in despair or became bound by a sense of inferiority. I had too much self-confidence for that. Why was this? When I was walking along the street or I went swimming, or went down a side street where some gangsters were hanging out, I was never in the least bit disturbed. I had trained my body to such an extent that I was not afraid of gangsters, even though I am small of stature. The reason for this was that I was physically weak and I wanted to be able to protect myself. If I had been large of stature and strong, I probably wouldn't have made any such plans to protect myself. But you might think that if I were thrown to the ground, I would be able to bounce back up like a roly-poly doll. But when I thought about my situation and realized what kind of problems might arise, it was inevitable that I would be aware that I needed some means of rescue. So I read many different books in an effort to find comfort. Then, in order to put things out of my mind, I would always carry an empty notepad around with me, a sketchbook. And whenever I sat down, I would draw. I drew images of people sitting around, people talking, people playing a game of Go or a game of chess. I would sit down quietly beside these people and sketch away, just like a photographer taking random snaps. I was never bored for a moment. When I was about 21 years old, I was never heard saying, I'm bored. I'm tired. This is dreary or uninteresting. I was always really busy. 
I kept myself very busy. But at the same time, there was a thought that would flash through my mind from time to time. What am I gaining from all this? This problem arose in my mind. So in my heart, I thought I needed to sort this out once and for all. I wondered if there might be some way that could completely change the way I had lived so far. I thought everyone else is just carrying on with their lives, so what's so great about living a special life on my own? I had this problem. But whether it was fortunate or not, a path opened in front of me. I had an opportunity to receive a Bible. On March 17, 1962, I was given a Bible, a big one. We had a Bible in our house as well. But this Bible, I received through my own efforts. Even so, I wasn't very happy about it. But because the person who presented it to me said that I was not the kind of person who would continue to read the Bible, I was determined to prove him wrong, and I began reading it for this reason alone. But as I was reading the Bible, I came to see that there was a tremendous darkness that had taken hold of my heart. I came to acknowledge that there was sinful nature within me, something that I had not thought about very deeply before this time. It wasn't something vague like, a lie that you tell in the spur of the moment is a sin. It wasn't anything like that. As I read the Bible, I acknowledged formally that because I have a sinful nature inside of me, it was only through my own efforts that I didn't commit such sins. Because of this nature within me, sin could spring out at any time when needed. After that, I began to look back on all that I had done during the adolescent days of my youth, including the attitude I had in my heart. I came to realize that I was languishing deep in a sinful heart. Then one day, it was April 7th of that same year. It was around 8.30 in the evening. I was listening to someone talking about the Bible. He was talking about the death of Jesus, something that was common knowledge to me. From childhood, I had known the Bible verse that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. I knew this very well. But on that day, I came to believe it for the first time in my life. For the first time, I could address God as Lord in my heart. I came to absolute assurance of faith. I felt as though all the darkness in my mind gradually withdrew. In my heart, it was like a room that had been in darkness, a hall like this one, and gradually, the darkness all faded away as the light entered in and lit up the room. I had this strange experience in my heart. There's a light in the valley of death now for me. Since Jesus came into my heart. Just as this song describes, I also felt at peace. After that day, any doubts I had about the virgin birth of Jesus were put to an end. I had no more reason to question it, and I didn't have to make an effort to believe it. I simply came to believe it. I came to accept Jesus' resurrection with absolute certainty. I came to believe. And that faith was something I couldn't get rid of, even if someone told me that he would kill me if I believed. I just ended up believing, and I didn't need to make a great effort to believe. These doubts I had began to disappear one by one.
There was an incident that happened about 10 or so years after this, when I was working at a broadcasting station. A government official that was in a fairly high position came to visit me one day. Someone had referred him to me, and so he came to see me. As we began to talk, he asked me, Can I ask you a question? I had never met this person before. So I said, yes, go ahead. What kind of question do you have? He said, I heard you give a lecture somewhere, and I thought that if it were you, it might be possible. So I came to visit you. I said, is that right? What do you mean by that? He said, I was born and raised in a devout Christian family. Even now, my mother prays for me. Due to this influence, I also became a Christian through and through. I've never walked down the wrong path in society, and until now, I've been living as an honest Christian as best as I can. I also have a certain position at my church. But please, answer me frankly. This is the kind of person I am. Then he said to me, but I don't know if you have any of these kinds of doubts that I have. And he went on to ask me about the things I hadn't been able to believe no matter what, such as Jesus' virgin birth and his resurrection. He asked me about these things one by one. He said, When I was baptized, I answered all the questions in the catechism, but I don't have certainty. I just can't seem to believe. Do you believe? I answered him. It is not that I have better faith because I am better than you. I also had many doubts, but one day I came to believe. I've had no more doubts since that day. This is a fact that does not change. I have definitely come to trust completely. I was able to entrust everything to him. He said, Oh, I'm very envious. Could something like that happen to me too? I told him, It is possible if the Spirit of God is with you. There's a chance it can happen to you too. As we live in this society, our minds and our thoughts are educated according to this society. But to forcefully suppress this and say that we believe is something that our conscience would not allow. Since this matter of coming to believe is something that occurs through the mystery of God, it is a very glorious thing. I hope that it is made possible for you too. I am much younger than you, and so I do not wish to rashly open the Bible and speak and preach to an elder like you. But please feel free to come again any time if you feel inclined to do so. At that time, I was 32 years old. When I think back on it, I realize that there are probably still many people like him in this world. Do you mind if I take my jacket off? There are probably still many such people in this world. It's not just me, but there are probably a lot of people around us and in this world that we live in who are asking the same questions as that man did. This is a thought I came to have. But one day after teaching a Sunday school class at the Presbyterian church I attended, We had a teacher's meeting. The children had all left and the teachers were cleaning up. We had brooms and we were organizing the chairs and cleaning up. Then somewhere from the other side of the room, I heard someone singing a hymn. My one wish, Lord, is this alone to serve thee all my days. Then rise to stand before thy throne and sing thy deathless praise. 
Like arrow flight, the moments pass. Redeem at Christ's control. Someone was singing this hymn, and as I hummed along too, something strangely welled up inside me. I went behind a pillar in the back of the room and sat down and prayed, God, thank you. You saved me from the depths of sin and allowed me to stand in the ranks of salvation. Thank you for allowing me to live for this. Wherever I go, please let me continue doing your work for the rest of my life. Up until then, when it came to the matter of sure salvation, I separated the salvation of the Spirit from the salvation of the flesh. So I never asked people, Are you saved? You need to be saved. I was very careful with my words and only asked questions such as, Do you believe in Jesus without doubt? Has there been a time when you believed with certainty that Jesus Christ died for our sins and your sins? This was the extent of my questions. I didn't want to simply quote and apply any verse in the Bible just because it was a verse that I knew. This is because, until a person knows how weak man like himself is, who has fallen into sin and is in agony, he doesn't really need a savior. There is a verse that says, one who is full loathes honey from the comb. So one first needs to know that his spirit has fallen into a tremendous pit and that he is struggling in sin. What is the extent of this sin? There was something that happened to me one day. I was someone who thought that I didn't sin that much from a moral standard. But one day, as I was reading the Bible, I pushed it away. The reason I pushed it away was because I thought, why is this kind of passage in the Bible? It was a passage about Lot, who brought his two daughters out with him when he was fleeing from Sodom. He and his two daughters left behind his sons-in-law and escaped the city of Sodom, which was about to be destroyed. But his wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. This account is recorded in the Bible. Later, Lot and his two daughters settled in a place where there were no men, and his daughters became worried. So they gave wine to their father to drink, so that he would become drunk. And they each slept with him. When I read this passage, I was very startled and thought, I thought only good words were written in the Bible. What kind of passage is this? And I pushed the Bible away. But I thought, it's so strange. Why were there instances like this? When I read some sort of racy book, I would read it alone with all the lights turned on and all the blinds closed, where no one could see me. I would have fun reading it, and afterwards, I would pretend I never read it, but I thought, the Bible completely bores a hole into my heart in a forthright manner. There are people who have the same mind as I did, who live with the outward appearance of having a moral code, refinement, and education, being conscious of other people. I believed that I lived a pure life, but I thought about these two young women and what they did. I wondered what kind of person I would be if I lived in a world without any law and without having to be conscious of other people. When I thought about what kind of person I was, I am someone who knows how to read racy books, so I am just like them. It was a heart of lust that merely was not carried out into action. When this is given a scientific interpretation nowadays, it's easy to say that this is nothing serious, that it's a spontaneous occurrence and something that happens since man has his physical body. But this was not the case with the state of my heart. Ever since some time ago, I think it must have started since I was in middle school, there was a pretty girl who always passed by me on my way to school. She was around my age. 
She looks so innocent and pretty. I would walk with my eyes straight ahead of me, but since I wasn't blind, I couldn't not see her. But I had this thought. If that girl knew that I was thinking about her, she may have given me a slap across the cheek and said, get a hold of yourself, in your dreams. Despite that, during those few seconds, I had the freedom to think what I wanted. But outwardly, I would act normal. One day, I heard a song that the kids were singing. It is said that Joe and Jane liked each other. That was the case with me too. Then they sang, but they pretended not to. And that's what I was doing too. But why was it that I was caught up in this form of hypocrisy when I was just 22 years old? This tormented me. Also, when I went to places like the beach, instead of swimming, I would sketch images of people from a distance, of them sunbathing, or sitting and chatting, or walking. And once I got home, I thought, I'm just striving to capture the beauty of humans. But I knew my inner thoughts because I was picturing the physique of the person in my mind. So then what is in the heart? I came to know that the sin of a person who draws and imagines what he wants is a hundred times worse than that of a person who does not do this. So if I read a vulgar and racy book, I would stay up all night reading it, but then in front of other people I would pretend like I haven't read it. I would hide it in the back of the bookcase. Then when my friends would come over and say, you're old enough to be dating, why do you only read sophisticated books? Don't you have any romance novels or something like that? I would simply laugh inside. Even though one may say that nothing is sinful about that, the fact that I was covering up my sinful nature was a sin in and of itself. The fact that I pretended not to be like that. But one day I discovered these words in the Bible. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. When I saw this, I had no choice but to raise my hands in defeat. I thought, God, I too am a sinner. It wasn't that I vaguely realized I was a sinner. When I came to know my sinful nature through the Bible verses such as, For you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. I thought, God, how can I be forgiven for these sins? I knew all of this as doctrine, and even if I were to confess with my mouth all the sins that agonized and tormented my heart, there were too many sins I couldn't remember. But in the Bible it says, Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. It says that man commits every possible sin there is. So how would it be possible to remember all of them? If they were sins committed against another person, it would be possible to apologize and repay that person for any harm done. But how can you resolve the sins that merely cross your mind? I came to know later that it is much more painful to pretend not to have a sinful nature. So I discovered through the Bible, ah, even though my sins are black as ink, even though they are like a dark cloud, they can be resolved as God promised. This is the heart I came to have. So as I read the Bible, I came to know if we are certain of the salvation of our spirits, 
on the day that God sends Jesus Christ back to this earth, our bodies will also be completely transformed through His power, and our complete salvation will be fulfilled on that day. We will receive the end result of our faith, the salvation of our souls, or spirits as it says in some translations. The promise of the salvation of our spirits is a promise made to our spirits. If that is so, then this is a complete and perfect salvation. His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. Glory, glory, thus I sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I came to know that this is true. There was a time when I felt so relieved while reading the Bible, even though I knew with certainty that my sins were forgiven. If I may introduce this to you, it is about the path that my spirit has taken. Even though I was absolutely certain of the forgiveness of my sins and I was absolutely sure that I had been forgiven, at the back of my mind was a lingering thought, I will continue to sin until I face death. So I came to discover something while reading the Bible. Let's say these are the sins I committed knowingly. And these are the sins I committed unknowingly. If I were conscious of them, it would be like, if you mess with me, I will kill you. But if you beat around the bush to save your skin, or if you were trying to cover for someone, your lies can multiply. Whether you sin knowingly or unknowingly, the day Jesus said, I died for your sins, your sins are as the hymn goes, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You sing nothing but the blood of Jesus, but after that is an unknown world. We will continue to commit sins knowingly and unknowingly. Even though I already believed in Jesus, while reading the Bible I came to see, ah, this is how it happened. God gave the Jews methods for offering sacrifices. What were some of these methods? In order for a person's sins to be cleansed, certain animals such as lambs, goats, and calves were brought before the priests. It was for the sins of the sinners. Then priests then laid the person's sin on these animals, instead killed these animals and offered them as sacrifices before God. These regulations were carried out among the Jews in Old Testament times. Even though the priests offered these sacrifices, because the high priest would eventually die, he had to be succeeded. So they had to offer sacrifices continually. But man cannot give sacrifices continually because he is weak. So because the blood of animals cannot forgive the sins of people eternally, the Lamb of God came as a sacrifice for eternal redemption. Jesus, the Lamb of God, shed His blood on the cross to eternally forgive our sins. Deaths of thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of millions of pure animals could not accomplish what this one man Jesus, the only Son of God, accomplished through His death. Through this one death, Jesus, the only Son of God, obtained eternal redemption by shedding His precious blood and eternally forgave our sins. God saw that blood 
and forgave our sins. He forgave us sinners who were covered in that blood. I came to see this in the Bible. Let's turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Because there are many very important words written here, I'm worried that I might fail to address them properly. Before we read Hebrews chapter 10, let's first turn to chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. If you've turned to it, let's read verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Next, verse 13. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. This is saying that they did this in Old Testament times. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. Let's think up to this point. The first covenant is referring to what's written in the five books of Moses in the Old Testament. According to that command, even the blood of animals took the place of man's sins. So then how much more will the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who was nailed to the cross, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? This is what this passage is explaining. A long time before Jesus was born on this earth, one of the prophets who wrote the Psalms said, Let's read this in Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 5. Have you turned to it? Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Verse 7. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. One thousand years before Jesus Christ was born, one thousand years before Jesus Christ came to this world in the flesh, a prophet wrote these words. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. How did he predict them? Verse 7. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, in the Old Testament. I have come to do your will, my God. God spoke in advance of the death of Jesus that would take place a thousand years later. Next, let's read from verse 9. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all. We often sing this hymn that goes, While I to the fountain go, And my heart the waves are cleansing, Whiter than the driven snow. If we have the heart to go before the cross of Jesus and quietly place our heart, 
the heart that was stained with sin before him and say, Lord, thank you for bearing my sins, then, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Next, verse 12. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Though your sins be as scarlet, and he'll remember them no more. There's a hymn that goes like this, isn't there? He'll remember them no more. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. God has eternally covered our sins with the blood of Jesus. We sing this hymn that goes, Glory, glory, thus I sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Next, verse 14. For by one sacrifice, by Jesus as the eternal sacrifice, He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. A person's sins are forgiven not only for the half of his life, but forever. Let's take a look. Not only past sins are forgiven, but from everlasting. People of Old Testament times lived believing in His coming. People of New Testament times believe in what He had already accomplished when He came. Lambs, goats, and calves served as an example that shows the things that would later take place. These animals were slaughtered and their blood was sprinkled to forgive the sins of man. But now the Son of the Eternal God was crucified and His blood was shed. How much more then will His blood cleanse your sins forever? But He has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of Himself. B.C. and A.D. We look at the past that has already passed by. We look back and believe in the fact that Jesus came 2,000 years ago and died in our place for our sins, and we are truly grateful for this. The fact that Jesus would later die was shown to the people in the past through the bronze serpent. In the time of Moses, he made a bronze serpent and taught the Israelites who challenged and spoke against God that anyone who looks at the bronze serpent would be healed. But some of them thought, how can you be healed just by looking at that serpent? It would make more sense to burn it and apply its ashes on the wound to treat the venomous bite. But when God said, anyone who looks at it will be healed, it is a shadow of what it means to believe. It was no longer necessary to kill sheep and other animals, but the shadow that had been shown in the blueprint was now completed. The blood Jesus shed on the cross doesn't only forgive the sins we committed in the past, but He obtained eternal redemption. Whether it's the sins of the past or the sins of the future, whether it's the sins that were committed in the past or the sins that will be committed in the future, all sins have already been bound in the blood of Jesus. God sees us through the blood of Jesus, and in His eyes, all our sins have already been forgiven. If we do something wrong in our lives, after we have believed in this truth, we need to thoroughly ask for forgiveness before Jesus. To set our minds at ease. Why do we do this? If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is what the Bible says. Even after we came to definitely believe in Jesus, we still commit sins in our lives. One day, when the time for Jesus to depart drew near, 
he sat the disciples down and washed their feet. As towel girt, our Savior showed, washing soiled feet with holy hands. Help us to walk that servant road. Jesus, who said he came to this world not to be served but to serve, died for sinners like me and you, for everyone. Peter spoke of this truth later in his life. But at the time when Jesus came to him to wash his feet, he refused, saying, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus replied to Peter, Then you have no part with me. When Peter heard this, he asked, Wash not just my feet, but my head and everything too. But Jesus said, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Those who have definitely been forgiven for their sins need only to confess the sins they commit as they continue to live their lives. Salvation is eternal. But when it comes to sins that taint us in our lives, they are also dealt with through the blood of the Lamb of God. The Lord is at the right hand of God. And as the high priest, the high priest of our spirits, he is acting as the mediator for our sins, even now. Let's now all turn to 1 John. First John, let's read chapter 1 from verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. The Bible says that even if we believe in Jesus, we still commit sins that taint us. Next, chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours but also for the sins of the whole world. The Lamb who bore the sins of the whole world. Jesus bore the sins of the whole world. So would He have left out only your sins? And so the beloved saints came to have the privilege of living with gratitude and appreciation for the grace of Jesus for the rest of their lives. Therefore, we just need to confess the sins we commit unconsciously in our lives. And if we sinned, we must openly and thoroughly lay our wrongdoings before God because we have sinned against God he, as a parent, will discipline us, his children. This is how precious the blood of Jesus is. So, the purpose of the Bible given to man, as described in the Bible, is if you believe in the Son of God, you will receive eternal life. This is the purpose for which the Bible was written. And it says, whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. But Satan keeps trying to overturn that testimony and makes a great effort to replace it with other strange practices. That's why people claim to speak in tongues, make prophecies, and cure illnesses. They say nonsense like this. There are people who try to substitute that testimony with these things. But that's not it. Whoever believes in Jesus has the testimony in himself. What is this testimony? It is the testimony that God gave. What other testimony is there other than the words that testify that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our sins and has forgiven our sins forever? What could be better than that? So the Bible tells us the purpose for which it was written. It says we read the Bible to obtain eternal life. 
Let's briefly look at 1 John chapter 5. Let's read 1 John chapter 5 from verse 10 to verse 12. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about His Son. Let's stop there. It says, Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar. This is saying that because you do not believe in Jesus, whom God gave to be crucified for you, because you are refusing to believe this, you are guilty of making God out to be a liar. Because they have not believed the testimony God has given about His Son. If you do not believe the fact that God had His Son shed His blood on the cross and has forgiven our sins forever, you are committing the sin of nullifying God's testimony. If there is one sin in this world that sends a person to hell, it is the sin of not believing. A person goes to hell not because he doesn't attend church, but because he does not believe. Next, verse 11. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. What is the testimony? God has given us eternal life. Have you received eternal life? Many of you may still be unsure of this and this life is in His Son. Next, verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Whoever has the Son. If you believe in the Son, Jesus, you have life. You have been given eternal life. How does this happen? Let's read verse 13 together. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Bible tells us, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. If you are not a mystic, if you are not caught up by fanciful ideas, if you are someone who is in their right mind and you read the words of this letter and read them as they are written, if you accept this eternal letter that God gave for your spirit, the Bible tells us that it was written so that you may know that you have eternal life. He gave these words to give us the assurance that we have eternal life. And so, if we ask what the purpose of reading the Bible is, if we ask what God's true will for man is, it is that God sent His Son in order to give to those whose spirits have eternally been forsaken the privilege to live forever that is, eternal life. Let's all turn to John chapter 6. Let's read chapter 6, verse 40. John chapter 6, verse 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. In our studies, we have examined many words of the Bible, and I have explained numerous times that the purpose for which the Bible was written was for us to receive eternal life. So then, if you read the Bible to receive eternal life and believe with assurance the words of Jesus and the fact that He died for your sins, the Bible promises that you have eternal life. Let's turn to John chapter 5. Let's read John chapter 5, verse 24 together. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. 
Does it say you will receive eternal life or you have eternal life? Do you receive it later? Have you received the promise of eternal life or not yet? That is God's promise. Those who have received it will be grateful if they read the words of John chapter 10 verse 28. Let's turn to John chapter 10 verse 28. Let's read it together. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. It says, I give them eternal life. Their sins have eternally been forgiven. They are forgiven forever. Glory, glory, thus I sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This will be their boast. If you have been forgiven forever, it means that the eternal promise has already been fulfilled. And so the same applies to the term salvation. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. When we come to see through the Bible the fact that Jesus died for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, and we see that God's words contain no lies. What is it that we discover then? We come to discover that Jesus' death was not in vain. We come to see He died to forgive me. His blood is greater than my sin. That blood. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. My sins are redeemed, and the love of the Lord is that He has covered my sins with His blood as promised. His blood the witness gives within my heart for me, for cleansing in Thy precious blood that flowed on Calvary. I am coming, Lord, coming now to Thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. Ever since by faith I saw the stream, Thy flowing wounds supply. Glory, glory, thus I sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Is there anything of ourselves we can give to God who has accomplished this truth? A certain saint sang this hymn when she first believed. To rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, the woman who sang this hymn was Charlotte Elliot. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. She sang this hymn precisely in the spirit of being embraced before the Lord. Let's take a moment and look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I will read verses 5 and 6. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with His pleasure and will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. He has called us so that we may praise His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. Next it says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. This is what God said. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. If we believe in Jesus and we speak to one another, let's read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. Let's read it together. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. 
For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Is it will be saved or have been saved? And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is saying you have nothing to boast about because you have received it freely and not by works. That is, it's through the grace of God who sacrificed His own Son that He saved us. Let's look at verse 5 next. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And next. It is by grace you have been saved. It is by God's grace you have been saved. It is not by works. The Lord revealed His hand of salvation to save us in this way. That is why, if we truly believe in Jesus, not only is the salvation of our spirit promised, but eternal salvation has been promised. Even this very moment, many Christians and denominations, even many mainstream groups, say that certainty of salvation is unknown or that it comes only after death. There are many people who consider it arrogant to say that one has been saved on this earth and call it faulty doctrine and they try to overturn it. This is a problem caused by not having read the Bible properly. If we read the Bible the way it should be, we can see that we were already forgiven. We have already been forgiven for our sins. Which means that there is redemption for our bodies. That is, while we're living and believing in Christ, and who knows when or where the Lord will suddenly call us to Him, whether it's an accident or in war or due to high blood pressure or illness, no matter what the reason, when we depart this world, our spirit goes before God. Those who have departed are also waiting together with the living saints for a time to come. Until what time? Until the Lord returns. At a certain moment, on the day the Lord comes, those who are alive will be lifted up. Lifted up means that they will transform from this bodily form into a perfect form. Let's take a look at this in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We wait for when our bodies will be transformed. Then the saints who have gone before us will return. When Jesus brings them, we will meet the Lord with them in the air. Even those who departed first, who tasted death. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the saved of earth shall gather. This is a hymn that is widely sung, but now if we think about this, when clothed in His brightness, transported I rise to meet Him in the clouds of the sky. There are many people who sing this among all the hymns. Moreover, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me He hath made known nor why, unworthy, Christ in love redeemed me for his own. 
but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me of weary ways or golden days before his face I see. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me, of weary ways or golden days before his face I see, but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come, at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Even if my voice may be hoarse, this hymn is in my heart. Someone might say, you're out of tune, but so what? I still want to sing. That's just how it is. Let's think about this. What is praising the Lord? What do we praise? We await His return. I joyfully praise Him from dusk to dawn. I hope for His return on my way to heaven. The songs the saints sing peculiarly have a purpose. They are different from songs that just lament this world. The hymns that the saints sing all have a clear purpose and plan. They are songs about a blessed hope. This gracious fact that the Lord has saved us who should have suffered eternally in endless torment God, who knows this pitiful life we face, sent His Son instead to deliver us forever by laying a great bridge on His behalf between God and mankind. That is the death of Jesus on the cross. That death was the death to redeem us all of our sins. Each and every one of us is included in this. The Bible tells us that if we ignore so great a salvation, there is no escape. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you with all our heart. We lived knowing nothing about what grace or what love is. And we received this thankful love 
that you have prepared for us free of charge. For this we thank you. We truly thank you that you have eternally washed us who are sinners, a sinner like me, bound for eternal destruction by the blood of our Lord Jesus. May you be praised forever. If there are those among us, regardless of what their past might have been, who still doubt and aren't a part of your holy love, we pray that the Holy Spirit embrace them. And that you, who breathed life into Adam, uphold them with your words, so that they may understand that you have given eternal life and may receive it with thanks. We entrust all of our remaining time and all our thoughts to you, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.